Welcome, comrades, to episode two of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. Hope everyone's doing well out there. Hope you enjoyed the first episode we put out last week. And if this is your first time joining us, welcome. We have a special treat lined up for everyone this week, something I am very, very happy about. We're going to be joined by comrade Jason Brownlee, a professor of government and political science at UT Austin. Jason checked out our first episode and wanted to come on and share his expertise, his knowledge, as he has spent many, many years studying Egyptian politics, U.S. relations with Egypt, authoritarianism, and also teaches a course on the history of capitalist development and imperialism, along with other courses on human rights and social justice. This episode, I think, really exemplifies what we're trying to do here on Red Library. We're taking a very complex topic that typically doesn't get much attention on the left, and we're really wanting to dig deep into the content, into a really substantive analysis of the different material factors, ideological factors, historical factors, all these different things that help shape developments that we see in the world today that we need to understand to be able to relate back to what does it mean to have a position from the left on these exact developments. Jason's expertise and knowledge in the area of U.S.-Egyptian relations gives us a wonderful entry point into taking what we developed in the first episode and going even deeper to really digging into the nuts and bolts of the development of the U.S. and Egyptian alliance from the 70s all the way to the early 90s and into the war on terror in the 2000s. Jason's going to help us understand how the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993 really was a fundamental moment in the development of those extraordinary rendition programs we discussed in episode one, the developments that occurred in Egypt during the Arab Spring with the democratic uprisings and how those related to the Muslim Brotherhood, and an overall better understanding of the complexities of U.S. foreign policy and a way to deepen our analysis of these things to help better inform our writing, our thinking, our discussion with each other about what it means to be on the U.S. left today and how we develop our own understanding of being anti-imperialist through having a firm grasp of the historical relationship of the U.S. to countries in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, South America, and everywhere else that U.S. interests tend to override all sorts of democratic uprisings and movements that span the entire left political spectrum. So sit back, enjoy the show, take some notes, and we'll catch you back here afterward with a few closing comments. Comrade Jason Brownlee, the uh, the official, um, Mr. Jason Brownlee. So where would you like to start today? This is your book. This is your topic, your show. Well, I'd like to talk about why I wrote the book and how I saw it bringing some information into discussion and understanding of U.S. relations with Egypt that I didn't see being brought out publicly and systematically. And mm-hmm. the book came out in 2012, and I had started researching it in 2009. So I was researching it for several years before the Arab uprisings, including the Egyptian uprising, began. And I wanted to put U.S relations with Egypt into a different framework than the dominant one, which was that the United States was working with Egypt to gradually generate a democracy in Egypt, that Mm -hmm. the U.S. was kind of... uh, you know, nurturing the Egyptian government, pushing Hosni Mubarak's government in the direction of democracy. And that was the, the dominant framework within political science and also within policy discussions whenever I was participating in them in Washington, D.C. or other places. I'm wondering, being part of those discussions and those conversations, were there any particular influences or sort of starting points that you had to start challenging that framework that led you to writing the book and doing the research? Well, I took the line that Chomsky often uses as a good guiding uh, guiding, uh, framework, which is if you see a problem and you want to do some good the first step is to stop participating in the problem. Mm. So if you see, if you're worried about littering, the first step is to stop throwing garbage on the ground yourself. If you're concerned about misogyny and patriarchy, the first step is to stop participating in those. And I looked at U.S. policy and U.S. behavior toward Egypt in that light. And when I would hear people talk about 
How is the United States going to promote democracy in Egypt? How is the $200 million or so in economic support funds going to help democracy in Egypt? I would say, well, the first step toward promoting democracy in Egypt would be to stop participating in authoritarianism in Egypt. Mm -hmm. How about the United States stop sending people to Egypt to be interrogated and tortured and, and in, in some cases killed. That would be one way to uh, try to help democracy in Egypt would be to stop contributing to the authoritarian practices. And what I wanted to do in the book, Democracy Prevention, is look at the ways in which the U.S. had participated and had been uh, a partner in authoritarianism in Egypt and how the repression that Egyptians experienced was not just a local process, but was very much an international process in which the U.S. was a major participant. Maybe one thing I'd be curious to get your thoughts on is how you would contextualize you know, this view of Egypt and fostering democracy in terms of just humanitarian sort of liberal humanitarianism internationally overall. Like, I mean, I feel like it's very much in that vein, but how would you sort of contextualize this perspective on Egypt more historically in U.S. foreign policy? Well, I, I think it U.S. policy toward Egypt d- does bear some resemblance to the, the discourse of humanitarian intervention, mm-hmm. which is always very selective. Uh, it is rife with double standards and hypocrisy in which, for example, when Slobodan Milosevic is engaging in violence against people, since Slobodan Milosevic is kind of aligned with with Russia, that will be seen as a a grave human rights violation that has to be stopped and his power has to be pushed back. But when the Indonesian government was doing something to East Timor, that was considered uh, something that the U.S. could could absolutely condone and, in fact, Mm -hmm. give the green light for. So... Um, I think we see the same double standards in which when Mubarak was engaged in human rights abuses or when when Sadat was engaged in human rights abuses and they were serving U.S. interests and U.S. strategies, this was not considered to be a problem whatsoever. It only rose to the level of a, a problem with the Egyptian uprising and when it became kind of embarrassing and it looked like it was producing enough of a backlash locally that it was destabilizing the whole system and the whole U.S.-Egyptian relationship. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then at that point, the U.S. government, as it has historically in other cases, starts to scramble and look for some type of exit strategy, uh, both to save face and to preserve as much as, as it can of the existing relationship in the face of massive uh, popular opposition. Hmm. I'm thinking about conversations around anti-imperialism on the left today, the ones that I encounter, even if they're just more in popular venues online or whatnot. And I think there's always this division around groups that basically say there should be no interventions anywhere, period. Every person should be supported that is in any sort of way critical or resisting U.S. imperialism. And I guess whenever I read Prashad's book that we talked about on the first episode, what I found really interesting about it, and with Gaddafi and Libya in general, was just how much more complicated these situations are, you know, in Libya, but the the one most recently, obviously, in Venezuela. And it's not to say that, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think part of what I want to do on this show is kind of have this open-ended idea of, well, I'm here to learn, and I don't know if I really know enough to have a firm answer. But I think for you, it seems like you probably have a pretty, pretty um, informed and very solid idea about interventions and whether, you know, not only the factors that make them happen or not happen, like why in Libya versus, you know, not Indonesia or, or something like that. But I'm just sort of curious for you, I don't know, how do you think about approaching a situation like Egypt almost from an anti-imperialist framework. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. In Egypt, you would have a situation going into 2011 in which the government is not representative of the people, not inclusive of the people, uses repression. So basically it's authoritarian. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way for decades. And since the mid and especially late 1970s, that authoritarianism has been part of a U.S. security framework for Persian Gulf and the surrounding region. And so in this case, we're not talking about the U.S. The question is not, will the U.S. intervene against the government, but will the U.S. 
rescind its support for the government mm. and basically get out of the way and allow the people and the opposition in the streets to form a new government without having to face a security apparatus that's backed by the world's superpower. And so in that sense, it's a question of curbing, of retrenching American involvement rather than increasing American involvement. Thinking back to the Arab Spring and even now, whenever you encounter, let's say, like mainstream media or conversations just in general, whenever you, I mean, I'm assuming you talk about this just with like random ass people in the HEB on a weekend, <laughs> you know, you just strike up conversations about humanitarian yes. intervention and, and how we should ruthlessly critique that. Yes, it's a popular topic <laughs> in the checkout line. I'm sure it wins you lots of friends, of course. But I am curious, how do you see the relevance of I guess what your research showed you in Egypt for today in terms of popular conversations around any sort of discussion of, let's say, you know, some sort of democratic uprising that happened during the Arab Spring or, you know, maybe even today, which is what, seven, eight years later now? Yes. Well, there'd be two main implications. One would be at the level of international relations and relationships between the United States and these authoritarian security partners. And the second would be at the level of domestic politics inside these specific countries and the strength of their the opposition. And let me talk about the second one first, because mm -hmm. it comes back to something that you discussed in the first episode about the mole burrowing, the sort of Marxian mole burrowing, yeah. preparing the way for revolution. Uh, I think what we saw in in Egypt that was different from Tunisia was that the mole had kind of burst onto the scene, but did not actually have, had not really burrowed the tunnels underneath to to undermine and bring about the collapse of mm -hmm. the existing order. Mm. And so you had a year of really strong, broad-based opposition, followed by a year of control of the government by the Muslim Brotherhood and allied Islamists. And then after those two years of a kind of more democratic, more representative opening, you had the military come back in force with the July 2013 coup and uh, the rise of Assisi to power. Mm -hmm. uh, Abdel Fattah Assisi, who's now the president uh, and is just as authoritarian as Mubarak ever was. So that's, that's one big lesson that the kind of structural conditions matter a lot, and mm -hmm. the the Egyptian uprising was able to overcome major structural obstacles and, and derail the Mubarak government, but it wasn't able to derail the overall control of the military security apparatus in Egypt. And whereas the Tunisian opposition was able to do something, mm. sort of a, a more thorough house cleaning of, of authoritarianism and, and have a, a more open-ended start to a new kind of government with a broader popular base. I'm really fascinated by that. Completely different situation and tangential, but doing a little bit of study on Allende in Chile and the crew and, and all sorts of different situations of you know radical democratic uprisings in Central and South America, it always seems that one of the key factors is going to be the relationship of the mass movement, whatever it might look like, to the military. And are they cleaning out the military and really taking seriously how if they do gain power, the main challenge and the main risk is always going to be some sort of military coup and uprising. So from hearing you talk about this, it seems that you would say in, Tun in Tunisia, they were successful in doing that to some degree. Is that right? Yes, they were successful. And they, they dealt with a less entrenched military to begin with. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that the military and security apparatus was an important part of the Ben Ali regime, they were able to the civilian opposition was able to get that military security force to sort of stand back, to recede and not take charge of politics and not sort of reassert any prerogatives that it enjoyed under the prior regime. And I'm assuming there's got to be some connection there directly to the U.S. support um, through funds and ideological support, policy support of the regimes that were repressive and were entrenched. Right, exactly. So now let's come back to the first yeah, yeah. major lesson, which has to do with international relations and has to do with the tendency for the United States, but also other uh, major powers to continue supporting whatever security regime is going 
is favorable to them as long as possible, even if they have some rhetoric about criticizing the regime. Mm -hmm. Now, over the past two years, the Trump administration has has differed from prior administrations in its language about Egypt in the sense that it has totally shelved any democracy and human rights rhetoric. But in terms of the content and and substance of the relationship, it's basically maintained the support for the Egyptian regime. So we haven't had much discussion lately about U.S. democracy promotion in Egypt. It just seems to be totally... um, absent but i would say substantively it's been it's it's been absent the whole time mm. <laughs> but what trump has done as he's done in other areas as sort of like dismissed the rhetoric the liberal rhetoric that you would previously have as a uh, as a kind of veil over the the core and content and substance of the relationship what we have had recently it was a news story about a french president emmanuel macron being slightly critical of the Egyptian president and the Egyptian regime and its human rights abuses. But I would say this, there's there's no there there. It's much like what would happen when there was a mild controversy under Bush or Obama about criticizing uh, Mubarak going a little bit too far in his handling of the opposition. Mm-hmm. It's not as if France is about to seriously change its strategic relationship in the Middle East. It would uh, Macron has maintained a pretty militarist foreign policy, and if he wants to be able to operate in Africa or other parts of the region, he would not want to alienate the Egyptian government. And so here, I, it's a lot of um, sound and fury signifying nothing. So I just want to I want to point that out. And and the substance here is again a continued support. And let's talk about the United States with respect to Tunisia and Egypt, because there was an interesting and instructive series of positions that the Obama administration took in January of 2011. The Egyptian uprising began on January 25th of 2011, Mm -hmm. which happened to be the day that Obama was delivering his State of the Union address. And he delivered the State of the Union address, and this was just a week or so after Ben Ali had been forced into exile in Tunisia after a week or so after the Tunisian uprising had been successful, mm-hmm. and Obama uh, called Ben Ali a dictator. In the he said uh, words to the effect of uh, the Tunisian people have overthrown the dictator, and this is an interesting way way to refer to the Tunisian president who had been a kind of minor security ally of the United States, but definitely an ally. And the U.S. had had good relationships with Ben Ali, certainly hadn't put him on their enemies list. He wasn't considered a a rogue regime or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So he called Ben Ali a dictator. That same day, Egyptians were protesting in Tahrir Square. And by the end of the week, the protests, after subsiding initially, had gotten a second wind. And they were quite potent on Friday, January 28th. Well, Vice President Biden, Joe Biden, went on the PBS NewsHour, I think it was Jim Lehrer was still on it at that point, and, and Lehrer interviewed Biden and asked him, well, Ben Ali was called a dictator by Obama. Would you call Hosni Mubarak, the the president of Egypt that Egyptians are, are rallying against right now in Tahrir Square, would you call him a dictator? And Biden said, oh, no, Biden uh, Biden said, no, Mubarak has been uh, very helpful to, to us. I would not call him a dictator. <laughs> So it's basically you call the you call the despot a dictator, uh, the pro-U.S. De- despot a dictator only in the rearview mirror, uh, only or only when they're in sort of the ash heap of history. You don't call it them a dictator when they're still in power. That was an instructive uh, statement by Biden because it showed that the Obama administration was keen to hold on to Mubarak for as long as possible. Now, increasingly, holding on to Mubarak. As, the, as an individual, holding on to Mubarak specifically, looked untenable. Over the weekend, that weekend uh, of the first weekend after the uprising, it was around January, January 29th, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, that Saturday, Mubarak appointed Omar Suleiman, who had been his intelligence chief and basically the extraordinary rendition czar of Egypt. We can talk about extraordinary renditions later. Yeah. He had appointed Suleiman as vice president. Sunday, Hillary Clinton went on the Sunday morning talk shows and talked and said that the goal in Egypt should be an orderly transition. 
And this was classic U.S. foreign policy doublespeak to say orderly transition. They weren't calling for democratic transition. They weren't calling for a people power transition. They recognized that Mubarak might need to step down, but they hoped that he could be replaced by someone who was just as reliable for U.S. security and anti-terrorism and Israeli security concerns and someone who could kind of appease the demonstrators, demobilize the demonstrators without radically transforming the Egyptian regime or its re relationship with the U.S. government. So orderly transition was the watchword for the next two weeks of the uprising. So I'm curious about that in particular, because I don't know if you remember this, but on the first episode, I remember reading Prashad's book and just realizing I have very little memory of what this was like being in the States and reading stories about it or hearing about it. But what was what was the reaction just in terms of public opinion, general coverage of this in terms of orderly transition? I'm assuming probably most mainstream outlets were very, very sympathetic and very on board with, yes, this is what needs to happen to some degree. Well, the mainstream coverage to this day depicts Obama as having cut ties with Mubarak, basically pressured Mubarak to step down, mm -hmm. uh, thrown him under the bus. And when I was researching democracy prevention, I did not find evidence of that. I found standard operating procedure of the U.S. government in times of crisis when a client state is being threatened by a popular uprising, which is you stick with him, you shore him up as, as much as possible. If he's absolutely untenable, then you switch sides or you you change your your support you shift your support over to someone who will replace him while maintaining as as much as possible of the existing system and that was the idea with Omar Suleiman you're going to get a guy who works well with Israel who is a, a darling on Capitol Hill and has broad uh, bipartisan support and then, you know, Mubarak will go away, so the individual will be gone, but the system will remain controlled by this security chief. I participated in a meeting at the White House on Monday, it was January 31st, so that basically a week into the uprising, where the White House called a, a bunch of sort of Egypt experts and, 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 and also just kind of foreign policy wonks into a strategy session with members of the National Security Council, including Ben Rhodes and Samantha Powers. And there was a discussion about like what, what should U.S. policy be? What should the United States be doing? And it was clear from that discussion that the administration was not about to sort of get on the side of the demonstrators and mm -hmm. really endorse their call for a national salvation government or some type of emergency new civilian government. The thrust of policy was very much to maintain the security relationship and not upset the close ties that the U.S. had with the Egyptian military and the Egyptian intelligence apparatus. You know, one of the comments that I made in that meeting was, if you do this, if you treat this as some type of elite pact between U.S. officials and Egyptian officials, and you cut out the people in the streets, mm -hmm. you will lose any leverage to accomplish the sorts of democratic reforms that you claim you want to be accomplishing. Basically, the strategy they were talking about or the, the game plan was you get Mubarak to step down, he calls for new elections, you have new elections in six months or so, and then, uh, and then Omar Suleiman can be vice president in the interim, and then Omar Suleiman can be a candidate, and you'll have free and fair elections. And I said... Yeah, well, if Omar Suleiman is on the ballot, they will not be free and fair elections. Let's just be clear about that. Yeah. You know, these people that were in the meeting from the Obama team, Samantha Power and Ben Rhodes, they were some of the, let's say, more risk acceptant members of the administration when it came to replacing Mubarak with something that could be a little more representative, a little more democratic. In my research, I found that the other parts of the administration were more senior, including Biden himself, including Hillary Clinton, including Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. They were just four square behind Mubarak. Like, do not put any pressure on Mubarak. We absolutely need to stick with Mubarak. Eventually, Obama endorsed 
what the outcome of the Egyptian uprising, which was that Mubarak stepped down, uh, Suleiman also stepped down, and they were both replaced by the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, a military junta. That oh, was well, gonna, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you didn't get an orderly transition to Suleiman. You didn't get your number two pick, but you basically got your number three pick. Yeah. And Obama gave the speech on February 11th when when Mubarak stepped down and relinquished power. Obama hailed the heroism of the Egyptian people and their historic accomplishment, but that was, you know, way... <laughs> Way too soon to hail their victory uh, since the military was very much still in charge. Quite a different outcome than what had happened in Tunisia a month before where the military was sort of already moving to the margins and and the the civilians were, were really taking control of the state. One thing I am always very curious about, and especially, you know, this is a leftist podcast, right? So we're coming from some hopefully fairly materialist analysis of these different things. Whenever Obama makes this speech and says these things, and just general, this sort of sheen of humanitarian interests, and we care about democracy and human rights, I mean, at the risk of just being horribly cynical, I mean, is all of this usually just some kind of legitimation for the American people? Is it for the international community? I mean, it seems that underneath, and hearing you talk about this, it seems just very direct that regardless of whatever is being said about this, and I guess this is with Trump, whenever the the rhetoric falls away, this is just brute power relationships, strategic alliances to to further or preserve U.S. interests in, in the region. Whenever we talk about, well, yeah, there's this democracy and we're on the side of the people, like who the hell is this actually for? Yeah, well, it's almost like a nervous tick and like how much time do you want to spend interpreting it? It's just it goes about reflexively mm-hmm. that when the US exercises power, it will wrap that power in the language of morality. So it's yeah. like we have a baseball bat and as long as we wrap it in a nice, you know, a nice soft comforter, then we can feel better about using the baseball bat. Yeah, it's it's ornamentation. Mm. It's not the substance and we see that when you have moments like the Egyptian uprising where the government US government has a, a clear opportunity to support broad based movement of many different ideological streams. I mean let's remember that the Muslim Brotherhood was a late comer to the Egyptian uprising. Mm-hmm. And when Hillary Clinton was talking about orderly transition and they were sort of trying to play catch up and and co-opt the uprising or contain its power, they were talking about a group that was led to a great extent by Mohammed al-Baradai and and also a, a young generation of Egyptians that did not belong to the Muslim Brotherhood that were, some of them might have been religious, some of them might have been secular, many of them had a strong leftist element in their basic demands, which involved presidential term limits, ending the state of emergency, uh, having a significant national minimum wage that people could live on. So that shows you the the reticence and, and the fear of what democracy would uh, entail. And it's been baked into the U.S.-Egyptian relationship ever that, since the 1970s. Mm. We've been talking about what is not it, what is not the truth or what is not the core of the relationship, but we can pivot now to discuss what is the substance of the relationship some. Yeah, sure. And, you know, it, it begins in the early 1970s when Anwar Sadat is enamored with the United States and interested in shifting away from the Soviet Union to to get U.S. support under Nixon specifically. He managed to continue to receive Soviet weapons uh, up through the 1973 war, but his interest was to to shift and become a client of the United States. And the Nixon administration and then the Ford administration was was happy to oblige him on condition that he accept Israeli primacy in the area, that he not push too hard for Egyptian interests when they conflicted with Israel's interests, and and certainly that he not pushed too hard for Palestinian rights in the occupied territories. And so what you have, and it culminates under Jimmy Carter, is the Camp David Accords of 1978 and then the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty of 1979, in which Sadat 
agrees to uh, peace with Israel and to have a, a demilitarized Sinai Peninsula between Egypt and Israel. So you have this, this huge buffer of deserts and mountains. He basically agrees that there's not going to be another e- major Egyptian-Israeli war. And he he completely frees up that military pressure on Israel in exchange for becoming a steady uh, American client and a recipient of U.S. military and economic aid. And that deal that he signs was controversial within uh, within his administration, within his cabinet, and several of his top cabinet members resigned over the concessions that he made either before Camp David or at Camp David. And it was guaranteed internally within Egypt only through the power of his authoritarian regime. It was kind of imposed undemocratically on Egyptians. Uh, quick question about that. So the the cabinet members who resigned, would you say that they resigned more out of hostility towards the U.S.? Or, I mean, was there very legitimate interest and sort of ideological um, support for the Soviet Union? I mean, was there like a leftist, you know, sort of more socialist, communist sort of ideology behind that? Or was it just they just hated the U.S. for all sorts of good reasons. Well, now at this point, 1977, 1978, they're resigning because of, uh, I'm thinking specifically about uh, Foreign Minister uh, Ismail uh, Fahmi and then Foreign Minister uh, Mohammed Ibrahim Kamel. Mohammed Ibrahim Kamel resigned at Camp David, uh, not because he wanted Egypt to go back to being an ally of the Soviet Union, but because he was an Egyptian nationalist who mm-hmm. wanted Egypt, if it was going to sign any treaty with Israel, to get a decent deal out of it, one that served Egypt's interests. At a certain point in the Camp David negotiations, Sadat found that Menachem Begin, his uh, Israeli counterpart, to be intransigent and not willing to make compromises on Palestinians, also on uh, Sinai. And Sadat said, well, okay, I think we'll just, this is not working, we're going to leave. And Carter caught Sadat before he boarded his helicopter and said, if you leave Camp David, that's going to be the end of peace talks between Egypt and Israel, and it's going to be the end of our friendship, of our relationship. So Carter strong-armed Sadat to stay, and at that point, Sadat goes back to his negotiating team and says, Whatever Carter gives us, I'll, I'll sign. He just completely capitulates. And Carter is quite candid about this in his uh, memoirs and other participants you know, corroborate it. That basically at Camp David, Menachem Begin sacrificed very little and Sadat gave up quite a lot. Also, I just can't help but think that that was a total just alpha moment by Carter. It yeah. totally contradicts the image I have in my mind of him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He. Yeah. He was. Um, yeah. Gorilla mindset of Carter <laughs> there taking on uh, Gorilla, taking on Sadat. Um, Gorilla mindset. That's our foreign policy. And then, <laughs> and then, and then, uh, yeah. It's funny what looking at congressional elections in midterm congressional elections and then your future presidential uh, re-election will do to you. Uh, and then in the spring, and at this point, the Iranian revolution has happened and the U.S. has lost its prime, his prime client outside of Israel in the region, uh, Iran under the Shah. Uh, in the spring, Carter goes between Egypt and Israel to hammer out the last details of the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Sadat, again, is the one who, who makes all the compromises. And Carter talks about this. It was so easy to deal with Egypt. I just had to deal with one person. Mm. And he would impose whatever we agreed upon on his cabinet and basically this whole country of tens of millions of people. In Israel, Carter would say, I had to talk with Begin. I had to talk with his cabinet. I had to argue with the Knesset. And they're they're you know accountable to the Israeli electorate. Mm-hmm. And so there's this fundamental asymmetry to the disadvantage of the authoritarian country in the leverage that the parties bring to the negotiations. The Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty is kind of founded and anchored in authoritarianism. And one of the concerns for the United States ever since has been that if you actually had a popular, inclusive government, it could choose to renegotiate the treaty, 
or at least bring some diplomatic leverage to the relationship with the U.S. and Israel that these authoritarian rulers do not enjoy. It almost seems that you can much more easily manage, predict, and control whatever the negotiation is going to look like through basically just simplifying who's going to be sitting at the table to some degree. Yeah, absolutely. And I once had a chance to ask Jimmy Carter about this when they had invited me down to the Carter Center to consult on, it's like during the 2012, uh, 2013 election period. is the 2012 elections, I think. So this is after Mubarak, but before Sisi. At the end of our meeting, it was mainly Carter asking asking me questions about what I thought about the Egyptian military and such. But at the end of the meeting, I said, you know, in his memoirs, Mohammed Ibrahim Kamel said that you really uh, twisted Sadat's arm and and Menachem Begin wasn't wasn't compelled to concede anything. And the day after Camp David, Menachem Begin calls the West Bank, you know, part of Israel. So how do you respond to that? And Carter said, well, we always knew that Menachem Begin was going to be the difficult one and that Sadat was going to have to be flexible. Mm-hmm. Basically, I mean, the irony is, of course, Carter has spent much of his post-presidential career talking about Palestine, writing books about Israel yeah. and Palestine, mm-hmm. And sort of positioning himself as an advocate of, of Palestinian rights, but Palestinians are, and they are advocates, are living with a reality that Carter helped to produce, that he helped to solidify when withdrawal from the occupied territories of, of the West Bank and Gaza w- was removed from the table at Camp David and the subsequent peace treaty. And if you think about it, I mean, this was the moment. What frustrated Mohammed Ibrahim Kamal and others so much is this was the moment when if you were going to take any leverage that you've gained through war and use it to enact a grand bargain that will strategically contain Israel, you could do it then at Camp David, or even better, you could have done it at a larger Arab summit instead of a bilateral one. I mean, Mm -hmm. the, the fear was you start having these bilateral deals between Israel and Egypt, and then Israel and Jordan, and then Israel and maybe Syria. And each of those bilateral deals is gonna give Israel more negotiating leverage than it would if it faced Egypt, Syria, and Jordan all together. You know, like they're on one side of the table and Israel's on the other. And so Sadat, you know, totally broke from the other Arab states in his pursuit of this bilateral peace deal. And he he ends up with this this relationship that is is lucrative for his regime in terms of U.S. economic aid and U.S. weaponry, but is a disaster for the Palestinians. I remember in Prashad's book, one of the things he had mentioned in the, the 1973 war, essentially how the economy had to basically be bled dry to fund that the actual military conflict. So as part of what Sadat is reacting to and part of why these economic the economic aid that the U.S. is offering is so attractive, partially to help correct and repair the economic impacts of the war in 73, or I don't know, were there other factors as well? Well, yeah, the the economy was suffering tremendously, I mean, before the war as well as afterwards. And then it takes a nosedive, actually, as Sadat is pursuing neoliberal reforms and introducing neoliberalism in the, the mid to late 1970s. There are major price riots in January of 1977, which really shake his regime and also frighten the, the newly inaugurated Carter administration, too. Also, I just feel like the word neoliberalism has been introduced and we should all just be stopping here and saying, okay, kids, here's our word for the day, neoliberalism. (laughs) Yes, that's right. Yeah, it it, it was kind of a package. If you want to be on the U.S. side during the Cold War, you need to start privatizing, you need to start engaging in structural adjustment, and that means government support for basic foodstuffs needs to be reduced and that kind of thing. And that, yeah, that produced um, a backlash. And, And Sadat was... I mean, he was struggling economically through the rest of his administration. Of course, he's assassinated in October of, uh, of 1981. And, and then the issues pass on to Mubarak. One thing about the aid, the aid that has come to Egypt since the peace treaty with Israel in 1979, the aid that has come from the United States, that's important to note is that to a great extent, this aid is really a 
a fancy kind of money laundering. So for much of the relationship, the U.S. has provided Egypt around a billion dollars in, well, since the 1990s, we can say a billion dollars or so in grants to purchase military hardware. Mm -hmm. But 100% of that has to be spent on U.S. produced military hardware. It's not that Egypt can pocket the money and then go buy jets from China or Russia. This is not exactly aid to Egypt. This is aid to Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman. This is aid back into the U.S. economy, back to into congressional districts. I'm uh, just I'm laughing at this point because I'm reminded of whenever you go to a store and basically you purchase something and then you take it back and like, oh, well, we'll give you your money back, but as long as you spend it in the store. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, with other states in the region that have that have oil, like, like Saudi Arabia, they can finance their own weapons purchases. Mm -hmm. But Egypt, it does have some oil, but it's, it's not that lucrative, especially given the size of the population. And so here, it's kind of like, okay, we're going to give you a voucher to buy our stuff. Yeah. So that then, you know, when we need to fight Saddam Hussein and we need your, your tanks to help us be the kind of forward forces that go into Kuwait first, then, um, you know, you'll have them. That's part of this, you know, so-called aid to Egypt. And the other part, the economic support funds are often – are also largely recycled back into U.S. contractors and U.S. US material and U.S. products. Would you say that this is a pretty common arrangement for U.S. aid, especially military aid, not just Egypt, but all over the place? It's essentially a way to grease the wheels of this you know, system of production and the way that the military industrial yeah. complex is a core part of you know, the economic production. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, the, it's the rule, not the exception. Yeah. And so you do have some cases like Israel, which are not that restricted. But mm -hmm. in pretty much all other country that I can think of that is receiving U.S. military or economic aid, it's coming back into the U.S. economy. And why not? I mean, why, why would there wouldn't why give a free lunch? I mean, why not tie them back into your own products and services and, and sort of cement that material dependency? I mean, I thought we were just a generous, peace loving nation that was supposed to lead the world towards some, you know, the the city on top of the hill, but I don't know, maybe I'm right. wrong Right, and that's that. why, yes, and that's why we allocate our aid per capita for all countries on a, <laughs> just equally, doesn't matter if they're pro-Israel or critical of Israel or, yes, that's right. It's yeah, we're very fair. Totally unconditional, yes, absolutely fair-minded, right. Um, so that's, that's part of the substance of the relationship, uh, which was basically you get Egypt out of a state of war with Israel, and you've totally sort of, in that sense, shored up a major flank of Israel. Well, and I and was thinking about Prashad's book, too, and it seems that wasn't as big of a piece as I would have hoped, but obviously you were talking about 79, 79 revolution in Iran and the the shift in relationships to Israel in the region. And it seems that, I mean, maybe this isn't a, you know, a huge epiphany for anyone out there who would listen to a show like this, but the relationship of Israel and the primacy of Israel in the region, how absolutely fundamental that is for understanding these different relationships with places like Libya or Tunisia or Egypt or wherever. Yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I came across when I was writing Democracy Prevention and I, and I was it, it involved a combination of archival research in the Jimmy Carter Library in Atlanta, Georgia, and then also interviews with former U.S. ambassadors to Egypt, several Egyptian elites, uh, and then also a lot of members of the George W. Bush administration. One of the things that came across is that Egypt, the way to understand Egyptian politics is to think about is U.S.-Israel relations. I mean, looking at Egypt is sort of like the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of the U.S. Israeli drama. <laughs> I mean, it's they, they kind of become an onlooker after uh -huh. 1973, but they're important in a in a negative sense that you don't want them to be a problem for Israel. And so the Egyptian president serves to keep Egyptian public opinion in check and prevent Egypt from ever returning to its pre-1973 position of influence in the region, antagonism, or at least, let's say, assertiveness toward Israel. I mean, in a way, it's a kind of 
it's a story for Egypt of a shrinking role in which, you know, if you go from sort of Nasser's era when it was a leader in the region through Sadat and Mubarak, by the end of Mubarak's era, by the late 2000s, 2009, 2010, Egypt is really the main thing that the U.S. wants Egypt to provide is security around the Gaza Strip, like prevent tunnel smuggling, things like that. So they're essentially just an incredibly large bodyguard for right. the There's, Egypt's in the region. Yeah, yeah they're, a, they're a bodyguard. They're sort of sentry uh, for ballot, for monitoring not only not only keeping Egyptian public attitudes in check, but then very aggressively policing the Palestinians on their border. Yeah, I mean, and they're help, a police dog. Yeah, Sounds and like basically, yeah, dog. being the the proxy or the 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 local prison guard for for Israel. I have to tell you the little bit that I've learned about Nasser and nationalism in the region, and how important the non-aligned movement was and sort of these nationalist radical movements in the area. I mean, it's just incredibly tragic to think that whatever whatever was there in terms of some legitimate nationalist interest outside of the U.S., outside of the Soviet Union, the fact that it essentially turns into this country with all of its history being a, a brutal police dog for the U.S. is just bizarre and tragic and yeah i mean just this is why i'm really glad you're doing this episode because i mean all this stuff i don't even know when and if i ever would have learned about any of this i mean this is fascinating well and i certainly didn't learn it when i was in college at emory university where we would have jimmy carter give us a town hall meeting oh shit called yeah. out emory university just got called out on the show <laughs> once a, a year and i was <laughs> Yeah, shots fired. <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I just, I learned in college that Camp David, this is the greatest, you know, accomplishment on, many would say is a short list of major accomplishments for the Jimmy Carter presidency. And I just think yeah. there's a, there's a whole other side to it that is, you know, much less exceptional, much more troubling, uh, much more consistent with what we know of U.S. foreign policy in other areas. Well, I have to say, too, you know, one of my main objectives in the show is just to ruthlessly critique any kind of liberal, centrist, democratic kind of notions about things like this. And I I would say I remember Camp David, at least growing up and, and taking history classes in school, there was this idea that Camp David was this liberal oasis in between Nixon and Reagan. And it was just this moment that you never really knew exactly why it was so important or what really happened. You just knew that there was some attempt to have this kind of liberal humanitarian approach to conflict in the region. But for whatever reason, it failed, and then we move on. So, I mean, hearing this is... It's it's really enlightening to just realize not only was that not the case, it was maybe fundamentally the opposite. It was functioning in an opposite way than the typical story that I remember hearing about it. Yeah, and I have to say the only reason why I was really exposed to it was because I know Arabic and I was watching Al Jazeera Arabic in 2009 when they were doing a special on the 30th anniversary of Camp David. Mm. Uh, or maybe it was 2008, 30th anniversary of Camp David or 2009, 30th anniversary of the peace treaty. And I was reading also when I would go to Egypt, I was reading Egyptian op-eds from, from lefty columnists in Egypt who were pointing out the double standards of the U.S.-Egyptian relationship. I was not getting this anywhere from English sources in the United States, although I would have gotten it kind of probably, you know, obliquely from some of the more critical anti-imperialist voices. They didn't have the kind of granularity to really kind of activate me to get into the to studying it critically. And then that's when that was one of the main inspirations for for the book. You know, one other aspect here about the way in which the U.S. has kind of outsourced its nasty business to to Egypt is the extraordinary renditions program, which under Obama became less active because the Obama administration shifted from kidnapping and detaining people to just killing them with drone strikes. But over... So I just feel like there needs to be a pause there for that to just really sink in and just really let that percolate for a second. Right. I mean, you're having trouble closing Guantanamo. You don't want to put more people in Guantanamo. So you just wipe them and their whole wedding party off the map. I mean, it's a lot more... Really, it's a lot more thorough and effective whenever you think about it. You know, I can't resist mentioning some part of meme culture in this because I think one of the best memes I have seen 
in years is a it's a picture of the White House steps and there's a predator drone that essentially is looking like it's nudging uh, a body onto the front steps of the White House, almost as if it's sort of a dog returning something to its master. And the caption basically says something like, the Predator drone misses its its master so much, it brings it a fresh kill and hopes that it will return home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is, I think, just, I remember whatever radical potential could be in memes for political education it's probably this right here yeah 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 so um the whereas uh you know the predator drone uh, normally will not bring its victims home (laughs) the extraordinary rendition program did bring the victims somewhere Mm. the u.s had to think about where those victims would go so the program as this fits perfectly with your your theme of kind of exposing liberal narratives the extraordinary rendition program began under Bill Clinton. I remember reading that in your book and that blew me away and not only not only that I had not heard that but even reading Prashad's book whenever he talks about this he talks about George Herbert Walker Bush the 1993 World Trade Center but completely skips over Clinton. I don't even remember Clinton's name being mentioned in that book at all, which was, again, shocking to read your discussion of this and be like, oh, okay, like, well, that's a huge piece we missed. So, yeah, the first World Trade Center bombing, uh, 1993, is happening in the early months of the Clinton presidency. And the Extraordinary Rendition Program is in part a response to that Mm -hmm. and it's basically it's launched between the CIA on the US side and then Omar Suleiman over in uh, over in Egypt our man in Egypt Omar Suleiman the like I said he's the rendition czar there's a buddy film that needs to be made about this (laughs) yeah it's like Michael Scheuer uh the bearded Michael Scheuer with Omar Suleiman and uh let's go off to let's go off to Croatia we need to kidnap Talat Fawad Qasim uh, well, I think uh, Suleiman will be played by Channing Tatum. That's what I would vote for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or The Rock. <laughs> the Rock um, would be great. Uh, so, like a Jason Statham Rock. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll put it up on Kickstarter as soon as this episode's over. I'm sure someone is working on the movie that will make extraordinary rendition palatable for Hollywood audiences. That's and what the, someone's got to do it. <laughs> yeah. So, so kind of uh, victim number one is this guy Talat Fawad Qasim, who was a member of the, uh, the Islamic group, which is a local Egyptian uh, militant organization that was uh, connected to the assassination of Sadat, uh, didn't really have a major beef with the United States. And this is one of the things that the U.S. government under Clinton and the CIA start doing in the 1990s that, that blows back on the U.S. is mm. they basically start considering Mubarak's enemies their own, and they, they get entangled in Mubarak's own back and forth of sort of, you could say, state repression versus non-state violence or terrorism. And so they capture, they take Talad Fuad Qasim, who is wanted in Egypt for his involvement in the the plot against Sadat. And they, he's he's wanted and he's been convicted in absentia, and it's a capital offense. So he gets sent back to Egypt and is never heard from again. Mm. Everyone presumes that, yeah, he was executed under yeah. Mubarak. Uh, so that's victim number one, and that's important because the ambassador at the time and other U.S. officials have always said that, well, with extraordinary rendition, they don't call it extraordinary rendition, but any time we're, we're transferring detainees, we make sure that they are sent to a government that will treat them humanely, and we have to have these assurances. Well, if victim number one was covertly executed then you know subsequent assurances uh, don't mean much and and michael scheuer has said uh, just he said exactly that in congressional testimony michael scheuer was one of the architects of the extraordinary rendition program he subsequently written um several kind of post 9-11 popular books about u.s foreign policy i'm sure and, those are lovely and yeah and he said uh he said you know if you take an assurance from the Jordanian government or the Egyptian government, you know, they, it's not worth anything. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of implausible deniability. Yeah. Uh, I think Robert Bayer has said something similar. Like, I mean, Egypt is where you send people if you want them to just disappear. So there are those rendition. There's there's his rendition. There's a roughly a, like another another 10 during the Clinton administration. And these th- this is what blowback is. It's when the U.S. and U.S. targets get attacked and Americans get attacked, and they have no clue of the context. Mm-hmm. So 
during the subsequent years of the, the Clinton administration, after the rendition program starts, we have the Dar es Salaam and Nairobi bombings in 1998, mm-hmm. uh, killing uh, 12 Americans, hundreds of Kenyans, uh, and then a number of people in in, uh, in Tanzania as well. We have the the USS Cole bombing right at the end of Clinton's presidency. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there and I talk about in the book. I mean, it, it looks very much like a tit for tat. And you actually have prior to the Dar es Salaam and Nairobi bombings, you have a letter that Ayman Zawahiri, the deputy of Bin Laden and Al Qaeda, mm-hmm. publishes in the Al Hayat newspaper, responding to an extraordinary rendition, saying, "We've received your message, and we will respond in a language that you understand." And then you get the bombings. This is the U.S. getting wrapped up in, as I call it in the book, Mubarak's war on terrorism. Then the Extraordinary Rendition Program is supersized after 9-11, and the Bush administration expands it. Reports from Stephen Gray and Jane Mayer, who've looked into the data, and others, probably dozens of renditions. It's hard to to pinpoint exactly the the number. I mean, this is completely mind-blowing to me, because even whenever we have these discussions about precedents for a particular policy or some sort of action by a U.S. president that we consider anathema for whatever reason. So right now, obviously, there's critiques from the left about whatever Trump's immigration policies are, however horrible they are, it is absolutely vital to understand that those were basically structured and set up under Obama. The banning of immigration from whatever the, I think it was, what, seven to nine countries, how essentially those countries were identified under Obama. You know, at the very least, what I think this is kind of telling me is whenever we think about the war on terror, even for, you know, someone like me, who is very interested in trying to learn about this stuff, this context under Clinton, I mean, again, just completely evaporated from memory, from records, from reading any of this stuff. I mean, this is completely, yeah, just completely mind-blowing. Yeah, the tendency is, you know, you pick your party party affiliation, the bad stuff started under the other party. Yeah. That's when you begin the clock. So, yeah, sure. You know, uh, oh, extraordinary rendition must have started under under Bush. Um, so it, it increases under Bush. And there's one important case, very historically consequential case that, that we should talk about, which is the example uh, or the case of Ibn Sheikh al Libi. And this ties back to, uh, to episode one when you were talking about U.S. extraordinary renditions and security cooperation with Libya mm-hmm. years before the Libyan uprising and the U.S. war uh, against Gaddafi. In fall of 2001, amid the Afghanistan war, the U.S. is and its allies, Pakistan, are sweeping up all kinds of people who are fleeing from Afghanistan. So basically Muslim men who had been hanging out in Afghanistan um, in Taliban-controlled areas for one reason or another. And it's very much um, a kind of guilt by association thing where people can be accused of being complicit in the 9-11 attacks or part of al-Qaeda just because they were they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. So one of these men, his name is Ibn Sheikh al-Libi, and Libi means the Libyan. He's from Li- originally a Libyan national. So he was in Afghanistan. He flees into Pakistan where he's picked up by Pakistani intelligence. Then he's handed over to the FBI, and they start questioning him. And the FBI, when they're questioning... In comparison to the CIA, the FBI is trying to build a prosecutable case in court where the CIA wants to collect intelligence. Mm-hmm. There, And so the FBI is a bit more concerned with following the rights that prisoners would have and sort of doing lo- more of like a law and order kind of thing where you're supposed to, I don't know, read them their rights. And the CIA, not so much. Okay, So the FBI, as the report's as we have from reports, the FBI was making some progress getting information from this guy, but then the CIA takes him and they blindfold him and and secretly send him to Egypt. They extraordinarily render him to Egypt Mm -hmm. to the good graces of our friend Omar Suleiman. So he's put in an Egyptian uh, dungeon and the Egyptian security services. He's being held so he's in this this building where other people are being tortured. He can hear the, the torture going on down the hallway. And his interrogators show up and they say, we're going to come to you next. And the subject of our discussion is going to be Saddam Hussein's connections to Al-Qaeda. So the implication is, you better tell us something about Saddam Hussein being connected to Al-Qaeda. <laughs> or you're going to be screaming like your buddies down the hall. Oh, I mean, that's a, an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> yeah. So um, Ibn Sheikh Libi makes up a story about Saddam Hussein's connections to Al-Qaeda. 
which is then featured in the Bush administration's public rhetoric in advocating a, a war with Iraq. Now, the CIA professionals uh, immediately doubt this story, and Libby later recants it. Mm -hmm. So it's totally discredited like from the get-go. But it's in the mix, and if people like Dick Cheney want to seize on it, they can say, oh, well, there's this guy, and he told interrogators in Egypt Saddam Hussein has links to al-Qaeda. And I'm assuming there's no awareness or at least a turning a blind eye to the fact that he recanted and the CIA Right, absolutely. Actually, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they don't, yeah, yeah. They don't care. Yeah. Ibn Sheikh al Libya is then sent to Libya. He's sent to, he goes from an Egyptian prison to a, a Libyan prison where he allegedly committed suicide. So, which we generally interpret to mean he was killed by, by Gaddafi's people in Libya. I can think of no better horrible, tragic story that really ties all of this, everything together. I mean, Libya, everything you talked about in the first episode, all of your work, all of your research. I mean, it's just, I mean, this one unfortunate, tragic death of this man seems to just really thread ev everything together. And then also the birth of the war on terror, the invasion of Iraq, and then everything that... I don't know if you'd agree with this, but what has at least been called maybe the worst human, you know, the worst war crime humanitarian crisis, foreign policy blunder of at least the 21st century and maybe you know ever in U.S. history. Yeah, definitely, it's it's way up there. I mean, I have to I have to think about like compare Iraq to Vietnam. I mean, it's it's that sure. <laughs> well, I'm not going to ask you for your like top five, <laughs> you know, worst U.S. foreign policy decisions. But it but would be in the top five for it sure. Was in the top five, it would be let's in the say top, that. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a terrible case, um, and we know that, that. I mean, that was just one of the the three major lies that that drove the case for war with Iraq. Another was the the in, the so called intelligence that came from the defector to Germany that was known as Curveball. He was not known as Mister Straight Talker guy. He was known <laughs> as Curveball, and he said that Saddam Hussein had biological weapons labs. Hmm. And he later, he's, he's uh, as far as I know, still very much alive. He gave an interview to, I think, The Guardian a few years uh, after the war began. And he said that he didn't regret it, that, yeah, he made it up, but he didn't regret it because he wanted to get Saddam Hussein removed from power or whatever it took. Well, uh, I'm thinking back to the, the testimony of the young woman in Congress about babies being left outside the the nursery to basically just freeze and die that was like a fundamental least ideological like uh, justification in terms of public opinion for the first gulf war yes yes absolutely um and then for the 2003 war the third the third major lie was the one about aluminum tubes mm -hmm. and the production of uh, a, a nuclear program i think aluminum or maybe that was for ballistic missile use anyway the aluminum tubes that were reported um reported on in the new york times yeah it was the even sheikh Libby had this claim about ties to al-qaeda totally fabricated in egypt thus played a, an integral part in the build-up of the the propaganda for the iraq war Whenever you started doing your research for this book, you know, Expertise in Egypt, and I mean, did you have any sort of idea that this is where where your research was going to lead, or did this, is this sort of what got you interested in Egypt in some way? I mean, the uh, it seems that it's really hard to understand the last 30, 40 years of U.S. foreign policy and all these huge global events without understanding the role that Egypt played and our support of Egypt and Sadat and and. Mubarak. I, I mean, it, it seems just absolutely essential to me. I, I had kind of a sense of the tip of the iceberg from going to Egypt. I've been going to Egypt since 1995, but I had no clue of kind of how, <laughs> what lay below the surface and how big the iceberg was in terms of the, the different ways in which the U.S. was implicated and involved in these security practices inside of Egypt. And, of course, I, what I was able to do was you know, interview people, fortunately take advantage of WikiLeaks, which came out right in the midst of my research, mm -hmm. and, and then really scour and comb through the public documents. But, I mean, I'm sure there is, there is much more out there. And I would expect that if you know, intelligence professionals read the book, they would say, like, he doesn't even know the half of it. No, uh, yeah. I mean, we've been talking for a little bit here. So is there any particular area that we haven't touched on yet or anything that you feel like 
is absolutely essential in this conversation, especially for people who might, I mean, hell, I'm learning this for the first time, but for listeners who are trying to take all of this in, what have we not discussed that you think is also essential? Well, one thing that ties back to episode one and your discussion of Frank Wisner Mm -hmm. would be my impression of U.S. officials and how they look at these, uh, these governments like Egypt when they're dealing with them. So I interviewed Wisner for the book. I also interviewed some neoconservatives like Elliot Abrams for Mm -hmm. the book. And it's interesting that basically when you're looking at U.S. officials that deal with Egypt, some of them think they're definitely not thinking in terms of democracy and human rights, but they are thinking about Egypt as a sovereign country that should have its own, that has its own interests. Mm Mm-hmm. And then there are others, and that would be Wisner. So these professional diplomats, they go into countries, they, they're they not picking regimes, they're not changing regimes, they're dealing with the regime that's there. And that's Wisner, and he's, as you all alluded to in the episode, he's, he was basically friends with Mubarak mm-hmm. going way back, and uh, and he, was, he saw Mubarak as a, a good leader for Egypt. By contrast, you have these people like Elliot Abrams, who they really see these countries through the lens of some other goal. They really see these countries as kind of instruments toward achieving something else. There means to an end of some kind. Yeah, and with Abrams, it's very much through a kind of Likudnik pro-Israel prism. And and that goes for Egypt and definitely goes for the Palestinian Authority, and I asked Mm -hmm. Abrams about both. And so the idea is not so much that you may be promoting democracy, like Abrams or other neoconservatives may talk about democracy um, selectively, but what they're really talking about is weakening the leverage that that particular government has to bring in any type of strategic discussions that are involving the U.S. or Israel or other major uh, partners. So just basically trying to minimize how much they're going to be able to exercise any, court of Im- any right. sort of influence or agency in that process. Yes, absolutely. And that shows in the, in the Hamas elections uh, mm-hmm. of 2006 when, when Hamas gets a majority of, of seats and has the right to choose the prime minister and, and then the subsequent attempt – the, the coup attempt against the Hamas government. And it's kind of like, well, we want democracy, but democracy doesn't mean you can just pick a government that's a terrorist. Or so all of a sudden, basically when democracy produces an outcome or a leadership that is assertive in a way that doesn't tow Washington's line, the response will be, well, you need democracy plus these other things. You didn't have these other things. So actually we need to reset the clock or sort of do do over yeah what just happened with that election uh, so that's that's something to to wrestle with is that in some cases wisner is like as good as it gets <laughs> it's a horribly yeah. depressing thought <laughs> but or at least you could say there's there's even worse than wisner and and sometimes you have to think about like what is the the concern here and like I think Wisner and other professional diplomats are are much more interested in some type of Arab influence that could be applied in the service of of Palestinian freedom than than the neoconservatives are. And this is why actually the neoconservatives are were quite opposed to some of the professional diplomats that had served in Cairo as ambassadors. They really wanted somebody who was going to be more uh, kind of Likudnik. Mm. But I, I think we've covered. A lot. I'm sure I'll think of other things uh, after this is done, but there's a lot to, to chew on here. I would just say that, generally speaking, when you're looking at U.S. relations with Egypt, as you are with U.S. relations with any country, what I tell my students is, you know, you could listen to the speeches, listen to, to the rhetoric, but pay attention to the substance. And when the substance and the rhetoric d- diverge, as they often do, believe the substance over the rhetoric. Yeah, that sounds like maybe a good place for us to wrap up and maybe the lesson to take from all of this as well. All right, well, Comrade Jason, you've done a great service to the left in general um, by providing this, and for me in particular. So, I mean, hearing you talk through this and hearing the stories about, like, Carter and Abrams in these interviews and how close you've been to all of these players in this has just been astonishing. So thanks for coming on and donating your time and your knowledge. Oh, thank and, uh, you. It's it my pleasure. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll have you back for another one because I know you're working on another book that's going to be out at some point. I don't want to say soon. I don't want to put that pressure on you, but sometime. Yeah, it's, it's a ways in the future, but I'm working on a book about U.S. military interventions in the post-Cold War era and trying to explain when the U.S. 
attacks and when it exercises uh, relative restraint or at least doesn't attack. You know, fortunately, we haven't had a U.S. war with Iran. I think that's that's kind of instructive. And it says mm-hmm. something about the ways in which material power on the other side can actually restrain U.S. aggression. Yeah. OK, well, maybe we'll talk about that at some point whenever you want to come back, whenever you're whenever you're feeling up for it. So. OK. Yeah, OK. Sounds awesome. good. Thanks, comrade. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. All right, comrades, that does it for us today here on episode two of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. Hope you enjoyed listening to this show as much as I did recording it with Jason. I thought it was a fantastic interview, a fantastic opportunity to learn from his great depth of knowledge, experiences. How wild is it that he could just talk about interviewing Jimmy Carter and Elliot Abrams? Hopefully with this episode, you got some new knowledge. You got some of that juicy inside gossip of the American foreign policy establishment. Had a couple of laughs along the way and took something with you that you'll be able to share with your friends, comrades, families, anyone else out there who you encounter in your work on the left, whatever that looks like. One more time, I'd like to thank Comrade Jason for taking his time out of his busy schedule to come here on the show to help share his knowledge, to help teach us, to help further us along in our learning about international politics, imperialism, American foreign policy, and all that other good stuff that we learned about today. Coming up on future episodes over the next couple of weeks, you can look forward to hearing Comrade Zoya come on to talk about the dialectic of sex by Shulamith Firestone, and my very good comrade Alex to come on and talk about Slavoj Zizek's recent book, Lenin. 2017. So keep your eyes peeled, your ears open for those. In the meantime, help support Red Library by subscribing on iTunes, writing a review, finding us on Patreon, maybe throwing a few bucks our way if you'd like to support the work that we're doing. And until the next episode, stay strong out there, comrades. Keep fighting, keep learning, keep reading, keep talking, and we'll see you back here soon. Thank you.